are doing the will of our true self. We are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. My name is Revel Raz, and this is Prag Magic. In this podcast, we will journey through the investigation and application of metaphysical means to enhance and inspire what I consider to be the great unifying purpose of our short human existence, the creative process. And it's my intention to learn and reveal exercises that ex-hex those inner oppressive thought patterns, as well as exorcising those lurking psychic vampires. So in me as I consort the unseen as means for getting the fuck out of creative stagnation. Stagnation that bewitches each and all of us, artists or not. And we're back. Excuse my absence over the last couple weeks. I had told Tommy uh, that this interview was supposed to be out on Thanksgiving Day, which it was intended to. I got caught up in some self-loathing on on my lonely Thanksgiving. Uh, Jokes aside, I pulled a muscle recently in my chest that has laid me out, so to speak. Uh, I'd like to blame it on the nefarious things of unseen beings that is keeping me away from, you know, bringing you this uh, quote-unquote content. But alas and alack, it was somatic and boring and physical, and I am yet still human, unfortunately. Uh, I just wanted to tell you how excited I am to finally get to speak with Tommy Kelly. I've been following him long before I started this podcast as someone that was just an astute uh, observer or listener of occult type things. And Tommy has always been just a great paragon of chaos magic and its beneficial and pragmatic, healthy uh, servings. Me as as a practitioner and as somebody that has been wrestling with my identity as a chaos magician, which I inherently am, I'm the first to admit, he really enlightened me on some aspects that I was abjectly forgetting. And his 40 servants deck, he basically created his own arcana, has been really cool, really beneficial. And I think it's a model that has worked brilliantly. There's, I mean, a close to 3,000 practitioners in a 40 Servants Facebook group that use them as part of their daily ritual. And his ability to not accept monetary value only with his magic and his art has been just a, a brilliant addition to this community in this way of thinking. I was a little sluggish in the beginning. Tommy is in Ireland and our phone chat happened at like 
his afternoon time, my on three hours of sleep, early morning time, no excuse, and it evens itself out. Just forgive my sluggishness in the beginning. So without further ado, here's my conversation with the Irish gentleman, the chaos magician. Oh, I'm sorry. The artist, the writer, the musician who uses chaos magic within his realms of expression, Tommy Kelly. I suppose in what point of the timeline we could start to actually when I found out about Chaos Magic was through Grant Morrison and that disinformation lecture that he did um, around about the year 2000, 1999, 2000, something like that. And without, uh, you know, being too hyperbolic or whatever, it was literally changed my life uh, having seen that. Previous to that, I, I did know who Grant Morrison was, obviously, but I, I wasn't, um, when I was into comics, I was into comics when I was quite young and then kind of you know, as a lot of people do, kind of distanced myself from them uh, for, you know, most of my 20s. And then when I came back, um, granted, you know, I had done the Invisibles and stuff like that. So it was tr tr true to kind of in term years that, that I had been away in the barren years, in the, the my years I spent in Comic Desert and um, that had been done. So I knew him from like early days of Arkham Asylum and Zenish and uh, all of that kind of things. But uh, um. So when he talks about chaos magic in that, you, are you aware of that? I'm sure you're aware of that. Everyone's aware of that video. That, uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, I wanted to relate to you with that because my introduction was his uh, introduction to the Disinfo Book of Lies. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when he was talking about sigilism and his practice, which I didn't see the Disinfo thing until a lot later, but, you know, we both, I guess, were pretty... Uh, instigated, I should say. Is but, that introduction, is that his pop magic? Yes. Is that that essay, pop magic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Where he talks about the spare kind of technique of sigilism. Sure, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's uh, For people who haven't read that, it's actually on his website. Oh, cool. He has that. Yeah. Well, and um, if, if, he's, he says he's quite uh, embarrassed by the disinfo lecture, you know, that he can't watch it. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, well, I can understand that. The one he's, he's, you know, he's drunk and he's high and he's, uh, it's not something he's used to doing. And, uh, uh, you know, I can understand that if, you know, looking back and particularly it's what, it's 20 years ago nearly now. So, I mean, I would uh, hate to look back at something I did quite publicly 20 years ago, <laughs> high and drunk and talk about magic and masturbation and uh, all of those. Things. Funny enough, you recently just met him. Is that right? I did. I did. Yeah, I met him um, within the last... Two weeks, week and a half, something like that. Two weeks, yeah. He was uh, in Dublin, um, doing in Forbidden Planet, which is the big comic shop here, um, doing a signing for the release of um, Green, the new Green Lantern comic, or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just I don't know how he ended up being in uh, Dublin for the release of such a big thing, but he was. But uh, he was saying that he's in Ireland an awful lot. He just doesn't get asked to do anything, which I thought was really <laughs> strange. Um, but I suppose, like I said, the other thing as well, like how how do you ask Grant Morrison to do something? You can't just ring him. You can't. You know, he's he's kind of he's not a huge social media presence or anything. So yeah, I think uh, it's somewhat his own fault to not that he doesn't get asked to more parties. He should make himself more available, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. It seems like a full circle thing because not only were, uh, you know, you're, you're also a comic creator. Yeah, and uh, the great thing about it, for kind of jumping the story slightly, is that I was able to give him the, the 40 Servants deck and he was bad keen and excited about it and he made me sign it and the box and all that kind of thing. That's so, so that's awesome. kind of That's kind of cool, you know, that, that doesn't happen that uh, often in your life that uh, if you can see it from going... Uh, from the video, from seeing this info, then to years later, to here's what I did with that video. Here's what, you know, here's <laughs> what I came up with, and him being, uh, you know, cool with us. So yeah, I'm I'm so excited to talk about the Forty Servants. I've got a got a bunch to get to with that, but I wanted to talk about real quick. I've heard you talk about like you know, age 27, you kind of went through a 
uh, like a spiritual, I think you called it a Saturn return. Yeah, that thing about Saturn return is that um, I'm not a huge astrology man at all. I, I, I know people who are like expert on it. And if I, if I need to know something, I'll ask them. I did try to learn it and I just went, you know, I was got really into it for like the three weeks and I went, oh, I don't care. Uh, you know, and it's just when people start going, oh, it's Mercury retrograde. I want to hit them. Right. Um, yeah, because it's like, you know, your life is just a bit, it's a bit shit. You know, that's, that's, that's what it is. It's not that. Uh, oh, can I, what's the, um, the comic code on this podcast? Can I curse? Can I not? Oh, please. Do I have yeah, to be? go, go yeah. any, anything you need. Yeah. Right. That's fine. Yeah. So like the, the Mercury retrograde I, and all this kind of stuff, it's, a bit kind of uh, I don't know it's uh, I, I can take it or leave it it is woo woo and I'm, I'm like I'm, I'm definitely up for some woo woo and stuff I just I think I think it can have, it's like oh right we go into this it's like say it's something like a demon right the, uh, and you can go I'm not necessarily agreeing or think that demons are real in the sense of that there's a hell spawn cell you know an autonomous spiritual entity as, as a demon okay um, but I, that's not to say that they can't have an impact or walk as if they're real or something like that. You know, I kind of, that, that, um, it's like, like people, you know, demons do plague people and all that. And it's not kind of downplayed. Oh, it's all in your mind. You know, it's all, it's just, you know, it's all, that's all in your head. It's kind of up how we view ideas that I think they're way more powerful than we give them credit for. And to kind of, to poo poo something as merely, you know, all in your head or as an idea is kind of a, it's not, you know, that that's not what I think. It's, it's much more than that, you know, kind of in the Jungian sense of your collective unconscious to all of these things. So while I say that I don't think demons are real or I don't think Mercury retrograde is real, it can act like it's real and it can have effects as, as if it's real, which is the thing that I really like about chaos magic is this. It's the acting as if bit of chaos magic that, you know, that's I find the most powerful of it, that doing something as if you know that that's is doing something and acting as if that's where the power is often leads you to where the power is yeah and that, that's the thing so like we're saying about the astrology that's a way off i'm still having got uh, i'm still having getting back to saturn return and um, so it's just the astrology just so that like while i don't think it works probably in the way i don't think it works in the way that it's meant to work but i think it works Sure. Because you're acting as if it works and therefore it works. But the only thing you have to then to avoid then is the self-fulfilling prophecy of say, oh, every time Mercury's in retrograde, my computer breaks. Right. And then the computer breaks every time Mercury's in retrograde and Mercury's going, not to do it me, bro. You know, that's all on you. Call it, uh, I call it uh, the Freddy Krueger effect. You, know, The more you believe in it, the more powerful it gets. Well, sure. Yeah, yeah. I think. But, but then the, the, the thing has to be uh, asked that where did that original belief come from? Someone just didn't. Did someone just make it up? Or is there some grain of truth in it? And therefore, you know, a pattern has developed out of it. Or, you know, so you don't know. Like, see, it's easy to dismiss it all out of hand, but maybe there is. So anyway, Saturn return is basically when you were born. Saturn is in a particular place in, in your um, horoscope. You know, it's in your whatever mm-hmm. your what's that word, the wheel house. thing, that horse, mm-hmm. house, well done, yeah, it's in one of your houses, so it's a particular thing, and it takes, the orbit of Saturn takes 27 years for it to return back to where it was, so every 27 years it's in the same place ah. in the universe, as it was. not in the same place in the universe because the, the actual um, solar system is moving around the universe, but it's in the same place in the solar system as it was, 27 years, and it marks, um, astrologically speaking, marks the significant, significant points in people's lives um, that seems to act as if it's, tr- it's true in the sense of it returns to 27 and you have that whole musician thing where, you know, that the, the doll die at 27. Yeah, 27 uh, so, so, I mean, there, there, you can you can dismiss it, but you can also point to loads of cases for it, you know, and it's right. kind of, it seems to be a case that when Saturn, who is the, um, he's kind of like the, um, the harsh kind of winter of astrology, like he's, he's the, the bad guy in many ways, but like be on the good side of Saturn and he's good. You know, it's, it's not as easy as good or bad guy, but he's definitely a harsh master. And uh, I always think of the uh, Goya painting, the Saturn oh, yeah, his son. eating it. Yeah. Eat, like he had his children because yeah. Of, uh, oh, yeah, all these <laughs> things, but it's, um, so he's, he's like the, um, the bad father in the same way as you have the terrible mother, mother, you know, it's that kind of the, the harshness, that kind of thing. But he limits you to, uh, or you know, puts pressure on you, or is an oppressive type of energy, 
with the kind of thing of that you grow out of it or you get rid of all the, the crud that you never you don't need you know it kind of purifies you all of that kind of thing yeah so, so it's it's easy to see him as, or cast him as the bad guy but ultimately the idea being is that he's improving you as a person and he's destroying uh, the things that you are holding you back even if in the moment it feels like he's destroying your life which, which you know effectively he could be yeah I... so Go ahead, sir. Go for it. No, go for it. The reason why I brought it up is just it, a bell went off because, yeah, I mean, typically the same thing happened to me around 27, uh, especially, you know, it was like the the end of my desert days, as it were. Right. And, yeah. So if you could explain what went down for you and what led you here. Yeah. So basically, the, the, the kind of thing that happens is that um, what seems to happen to a lot of people around the uh, age 27 and then again at, at 54 or whatever, but it can ha also happen just at the end of any decade, you know, when you're getting closer, like 30 is a huge thing when you're young because, you know, it's the first kind of point where you go, I'm old. And then, right. then you're, you know, as you get older, you go, I was so young. But uh, it's, uh, so it can mark, you know, kind of a, a period where you go, well, what have I done with my life? What am I doing with my life? And what had happened to me is that I'd, uh, wanted to be like a you know the the rock star I wanted to be the the famous guitar player the you know tour the world be the you know envy of millions all of these things as as <laughs> is the teenage want of so many people and I continued it in, into my 20s and I was was actually in bands did record albums did go on tour did all things but it was like all in a kind of local hero type stuff you know the, the local mm -hmm. hero does well you know to, did some tours in Germany and you know recorded CDs and all that before it was a thing that you recorded. You know, back in the days where it like CD uh, burning or being able to make your own CDs was out about two weeks. You know, it wasn't just the way it was, you know, it's a big deal and cost a lot of money to do. Like, yeah. so, 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 um, so it was that. And then I ended up, what happened was I ended up being a sound engineer because, you know, it's all well and good to try to be a rock star, but, you know, you still have to eat and you still have to pay rent and you still have to do these, these things. So it was kind of, easy to fall into it. It was something I was good at. It was not really something I ever wanted to pursue. I was really into recording and just kind of studio stuff, but not ever to make a, a career out of it to record other people or being a producer or something like that. But it was to, you know, so that I could record my own music. But having done all that, I then, you know, could it landed very easily to doing like live sound and that kind of thing. But what happened ultimately is I did that on and off, but mostly it's about 10 years so in between, I started doing, um, it was about 18, I start, first started doing sound, but I really went around 22, 23. Um, I, you know, I was more or less my full-time job. Like I'd leave Thursday morning and come home, you know, Monday morning, having been, you know, mm -hmm. driven around in the country in the back of a van, <laughs> to, you know, playing all these different venues and doing sound. And it just eventually, it just took its toll on me and I hated it and I hated my life <laughs> and I hated everyone around me and I hated music. <laughs> and it's and it's more than just because it was more than just I wanted to be a rock star and you know I was up then you know you're looking at people playing rather than playing it was more than that it was the tedium of it's the same you know people forget when they go to see a band that they're doing exactly the same thing every night so it's you know so the light lighting guy and the sound guy has has seen and heard that joke <laughs> a million times that is you know off the mm -hmm. cuff that that improvised guitar solo is the same improvised guitar solo as it has been for the last three years <laughs> and these kind of things and yeah. it's just it gets so tedious and boring that the only time it ever gets exciting as a job is when something um, catastrophically goes wrong you know like a speaker blows up um, a guitar a guitar player blows up or whatever it is you know <laughs> and um so it was just it was a nightmare and i hated it and i was about 27 and um my own band i was in was uh, had absolutely fallen apart um because of all of the reasons that every band falls apart because you know women um yeah of uh, you know, musical similarities, egos, all those things, mm -hmm. all that, you know, there's no, there's no new story in that, like that, that kind of thing. So it was kind of, it felt like an awful lot of things were kind of closing down and stuff. And I was as if I was at some point, get, you know, there was this choice that had to be made. You either stop doing all this or you're doing it for the rest of your life. And if I'm doing, yeah. I'm doing this for the rest of my life, that that's you know I really don't want <laughs> that's horrible I don't want to do that but you know that that's the kind of decision so you can either stop before it becomes just the thing that you you know you're 65 and you had 
oh, I probably shouldn't have done that for that as quite as long. You know, it's you just you're in the rut then at that point. So at least at that point, I was able to go right. Uh, I'll, I'll not. I'll try to get out of this. And I was just trying to think of what was, you know, what was the time, what did I want to be before I wanted to be a rock, before the glamour of wanting to be a rock star uh, became, and I was like, I was huge into comics and into, and I loved drawing. And I kind of, my whole love for drawing um, disappeared because I had a really terrible art teacher and who didn't, you know, literally didn't teach me anything but art and kind of didn't like comics and would put that down and kind of put that out of my um you know, did wouldn't it encourage that? And it was kind of just a terrible art teacher. And it, um, so kind of, kind of my love for art kind of just completely went because it's like, well, what's the point? And it's like at that point going to art college, it just I just I had no money to go to art college, and I, I had no interest in getting massively into debt for something that I, you know, at this point I've just kind of the love had completely gone how it had been taken out of me. So I was thinking about that and going, well, that was the thing that I really loved and enjoyed and all that. So I started drawing again. Well, actually what I started doing is I started coloring comics again um, in that, I'd, you know, I'd get uh, scans of, you know, like Tank Girl or something like that. And I'd, I was uh, in Photoshop just because I didn't think it'd be a good enough artist to be able to draw comics, you know, because I, I hadn't drawn in 10 years and all that. So I says, oh. It's ingenuity. So, yeah. So I said, oh, maybe I could try, could try coloring stuff because I knew Photoshop kind of well enough from doing band posters and that kind of thing. And then very quickly I went, oh, sure, I'll try drawing. And then I was, uh, because ultimately what I wanted to do was write comics. And I know that it's impossible, next to impossible for a writer to break into comics or to do comics because you're always reliant on an artist, you know, and it's like every, uh, yeah, everyone, everyone has a great idea and a writer. <laughs> so I said, right, I can either do that again and spend the next, you know, 20 years being frustrated or I can learn to draw and at least draw my own things. You know, so uh, I was a writer who drew at that point rather than an artist who also wrote. So that was because my goal was I wanted to write comics and I knew that the only way to do that was to actually learn how to draw this thing. But, you know, like that's kind of, I didn't, I was good at drawing when I was a kid or whatever. And I, I got, despite my art teacher, I ended up getting the top marks in, in my final exams, leaving school and stuff. So um, there was a bit of, uh, I was going to say talent. I'm not completely uh, sold on the idea of talent because it seems that the most talented people are the people who spend the most time doing it. But there's so there can be you know a proclivity of something like the, the in people. I think it's it's different in sports and in physical. People do seem to be born, you know, be able to run fast. Than other people, no, and no matter how much I practice, I'll never be. I was never able to run that fast. But with things like say art or even guitar or music, you can definitely become well above average if you spend the time. It's I suppose it's the genius level thing. You know, why Steve Vai is Especially Steve with magic, too. Right? Well, to a point, yeah. Like, But it's yeah. it's like natural born witches, I suppose, and this kind of things. I, I still, mm -hmm. I would be hesitant to say that, that uh, people couldn't, you know, like you couldn't do something because you don't, you weren't born that way. What I think is more likely with magic is the kind of, you know, when you um, play an RPG, a computer RPG, like uh, Skyrim or something. And you, you can mm -hmm. you can be a mage or you can be a warrior or you can be this kind of thing. I think what might happen with magic is that people are have certain abilities or, or classes in a sense, like where you have like a, you're better at div divination than you are at sigils, and you can struggle with magic sure. because all you want to do is sigils. But really, your character class could be divination. And it's funny I've I've I've, I've said that a few times, and uh, I've seen other people say it as well recently and stuff i think it's a it's a nice idea but it's obviously i don't think there's character class and magic though so don't take it too uh, literally for me your entire story is, is just so enlightening because there's so much ditto for me in that you put into words basically what 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 my life has been up until that point so it's good to hear someone else that kind of got out of the the music rut as it yeah. were and forged ahead with you know their kind of deeper callings. Yeah, the, the unfortunate yeah. thing is I got very stuck then in the comic rut <laughs> for a while. Right. <laughs> you know, so. Well, and funny enough, I am I am as well. Yeah. But, you know, what you're telling me is I need to draw. You need to, you need to learn to draw or you need to find some way of the, the key to... Visualizing. All, yeah. No, not necessarily visualizing. The, the, the key to all of this thing is to become as self-reliant as you can as possible. Right. Because if you're, if you're sitting around waiting on other people for your dream to happen your dream's never going to happen. 
and I don't mean that in like in a in a, in a cold kind of you know oh your dream level but it just won't because right. you know, you, you no just, totally just, you know just just do it like and that that by that I could also mean like find your artist you know like do your find that in the way Grant Morrison found his uh, Frank Whiteley you know or whatever yeah do that that doesn't necessarily mean you have to draw but don't you know stop waiting around for the thing you can do whatever it is that thing that has to be done that whatever the next yeah. stage is but it doesn't have to be the big stage you know it's it's that, that i really like this uh, statement which is tend to the part of the garden that you can reach you know so do the bit that mm. you can do do the next thing what what is the next thing you have to do and do it and then you know go from there but uh the thing the problem with comics and the big the the that will always be the problem with comics is that 95% of people who read comics also want to make comics. Right. And that doesn't happen really in any other industry, particularly in an industry that is ridiculously small uh, to start off with anyway. You know, it's like, yeah, I I, I don't know the figures, but uh, like the top selling comic isn't millions, you know, the way it's certainly not in the way it used to be in the nineties and stuff like that. And right. You know, the comics that are considered bestsellers now would would have been cancelled after two issues twenty years ago because the sales just weren't there or whatever. So not only is it a very small kind of gene pool in that the, both the customer and the creators are pretty much want to be this, you know, the same thing. There's not that huge of a market for it anyway, particularly if you step outside the genre of superheroes. You know, right. that, you know, because it's so synonymous with comics that it's superheroes that almost that when you think of comics, you think of superheroes rather than, yeah. you know, it's like, imagine if every film was a Western and that films had only ever been Westerns and I had just become so associated with Westerns that people would go, I'm not really into Westerns, so I'm not going to watch films, which is what's right. happened with comics. Yeah, to a large that's a good extent. point. Yeah, I had uh, read the other day, too, that like, you know, all of the favorite writers, even on bigger you know superhero books are basically like offered those projects they never get the books they want to work on well the biggest eye opener i've ever come across was when mark miller was looking for an artist for um what's that not hit hit girl what's hit girl from um oh kick ass kick ass k he was doing kick ass too and he put up um I'm looking for an artist for uh, Kick-Ass 2, or maybe it was, maybe it was Head Girl, or something, whatever, a big project, whatever. And he says, uh, send your samples to, um, you know, in this forum post. And it was mm-hmm. like 200 replies. And it was like, Jim, I'm 11, can't draw, followed by a guy who drew X-Men last week looking for the same job, followed by a 16-year-old who was Oof. pretty good, but, you know, had years. And like, where people pros in the industry like top class like people who are exceptionally arts who have like done let's say say x-men or you know did 12 issues of the flash or whatever had you know get on a forum put up a couple of their pages besides 14 year olds 13 year olds 30s 30 year old people who can't draw who were just you know having a laugh and that was that's i was going right there's comics that's, yeah you know, oof yeah well, good thing, you know, it's like it's a it's a passion for you, too. I mean, it's, you know, I was I was looking at holy numbers and it, it feels like you are channeling something quite deeper. And I wonder if, you know, the confluence of art and magic, chaos magic makes sense for me when I think of your your work, you know, casting sigils and making it's Grant Morrison's example, a hyper sigil, which sure, is yeah, what I yeah. thought holy numbers was. Well, definitely. Well, I mean, the thing about magic is that it's it is art, you know, it, it is, it's just a kind of a different approach in a sense to art in that a way to look at it is kind of that there's people who kind of, you know, there's this, this label type of thing that we have or that we do to ourselves where we kind of go, I'm a, you know, I'm a chaos magician or I'm, um, you know, the, the kind of people, go, I'm, a, I'm a fireman or I'm, right. I, I'm male or I'm, um, you know, I'm non-binary or I'm homosexual or I'm heterosexual. And we have all these kind of labels and these kind of things, which is all good. That's fine. I'm not, you know, be whoever you want to be, all of those things. But it's kind of limiting in yourself as you go, I'm a chaos magician. Yeah, but what do you do? You know, I oh, know I'm a chaos magician, but what do you do? Well, um, I'm an artist who uses, I'm an artist and a writer who uses the ra- reality tunnel chaos magic. What you think is a better way to approach it than, than, you know, defining yourself as a chaos magician. Like you could look at, say, Grant Morrison or Alan Moore, two of the huge comic, um, 
uh, you know, people who are most well known and um, who are both magicians as well. But they're not magicians, and that's it. You know, it's right. the, the, yeah. this kind of, as you say, this channeling of that magic stuff in uh, as part of their art. You know, and it's kind of, it's like if you're just going, the things that are kind of really uninteresting are people who define themselves by what they are rather than what they do. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a macho man. You know, yeah, but what do you do? No, this is what I do. I, I, you know, I walk around with my muscles. This, you know, and insult people. This is, you know, and you go, well, that's just not interesting. <laughs> and I say, you know, it's not. It's like, but if you go, well, I'm a macho man who goes around insulting people, but I, you know, I use this energy to, I don't know, create sculpture or something. You go, oh well, there, there now, now this is starting to get interesting. You know, because you've taken your, what you're defining yourself as, and then channeling into some sort of creation rather than just sort of like a stagnant energy of existing as this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So when you say the sort of channeling thing of comics, I 100% see art as a kind of a channeling thing, but not in the kind of, um, you know, Abraham Hicks or Alice Bailey or oh, channels sure. type, you know, yeah. there's someone over your shoulder or, or the Crowley kind of, you know, uh, book of the law or any of things. Not that's fine, but it, that that's just not what I'm talking about. You know, it's almost as if, um, the way I would describe it is getting out of the way of it. And letting it kind of, you know, it all sounds quite crap, you know, letting it come through you, you know, letting it flow <laughs> through you. Man. I know, and, but there is some truth to it. I know, like, uh, that that's kind of been the big dichotomy when I see your work is that you very, you, you have such a pragmatist approach, you know, and you want to uh, be sure not to give, you know, the adventures in the woo-woo, you know. Yeah. Uh, too much of that. And I, I totally get that. But I wanted to, yeah, find where where the line is for the woo for you. Um, it depends on the day and it depends yeah. on, um, it's what a constant I'm, struggle, right? You see, this is, it's, well, <laughs> it, 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 well, as uh, my wife always says to me, it is with that attitude. <laughs> yeah. If you see it as a struggle, then it is. Well, good way to look around it is to stop feeling you have to label these things or, you know, pigeonhole them or define them or delineate them or have them in boxes in that, it, you know, you can be this today. Just the, the beauty and the glory of chaos magic, the people forget about it, is that you don't have to be anything other than right. what, what you need to be in the moment to get the result you want. And that's the whole kind of principle of case management. It's become slightly different and people have kind of um, tried to put actual truth in a sense back into it rather than, you know, the belief as a tool, which is the idea of that your beliefs are powerful in themselves as belief. And the belief is the, the kind of the agent of change or the agent of power, you know, the acting as if this is true is where the power comes from rather than the act itself. So you're saying it's a struggle to where is the woo, the woo or where's the line in the woo-woo? It depends on what I'm doing. The line of the woo-woo when I'm tr- doing my taxes is very different from the line of the woo-woo <laughs> when I'm doing, when I'm trying to create a character or a comic. Totally. You know, where you can go, oh, it's all, you know, just let it come through you and flow and, you know, like get out of the way of it. It doesn't really work when you're trying to sort out, is this an expense? <laughs> Will I get away with this? <laughs> you know, so it's like, um, it's so it's but it's 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 not to say that those, those both of those factors aren't you know part of part of me. If I just it's like when you start to uh, define yourself again. If you go, I am a reductionist materialist, and that's it. Then you've closed off so much of thing. You know, like you can be. I'm a reductionist materialist when it comes to building my house, or you know certain views, or when it comes to say medicine, or you know does it work? Does it not work? But it, it, we're not Vulcans. We're not, you know, we don't think, you know, we're not, we, we, science is kind of, it's a brilliant thing and it's the best thing that's ever happened to us, but we've kind of we've almost religion made it into religion now. We've, you know, the scientism idea where, you know, it's become infallible right. and it, that we're, um, that we're able to view life or exist in the world scientifically, almost like the Vulcans, but we're not logical beings. We're feeling beings. We're emotional beings. And we've been so science has come from that. I'm not down on science. I love science. I play, <laughs> loads of my friends are scientists. <laughs> right. But, uh, uh, um, it's like it's, but it's definitely taken away the the self reliance, the self trust, and the um, you know that you are allowed to have your own opinions because it's you know we're told we can't we, we can't even trust our own senses. We can't even trust our own mind. You know. Right. It, yeah, anecdotal evidence is the worst kind of evidence. Yet we can send people to prison on it, um, you know. And there's the, like, 
to, to even to the point of that, to get over the hard question of consciousness, well, that consciousness doesn't actually exist. It's just an epiphenomena of the brain. You only think you're conscious, which if that's, you know, that's fine. Then we again go back to the prison thing. If people aren't really conscious, then are they really responsible for anything to do? And we know they are because we know we are living this life. We know they're responsible for it. But if you start saying the consciousness and, you know, it's epiphenomena of the brain, then you're kind of taking that away from it. So yeah. it's, 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 but it's interesting too, though. Then you look at, you know, like it's Daniel Dennett. Uh, he came up with the, well, not the idea. He's kind of pushed forward the whole thing of the consciousness as an epiphenomena of the brain, which just means it's a byproduct of the brain rather than using the fancy epiphenomena name. I mean, it, yeah. it's just something that happens uh, while your body is trying to keep itself alive. It just so happens to have this thing that seems to be conscious of itself, but it's not. So it's a symptom. A sim- not, yeah, sim- yeah, yeah, or, or a bike product or, uh, you know, just something that interesting that happened on the way, which <laughs> right. is also interesting in that it's very, very similar to the Buddhist idea of no mind uh, as well, where, you know, that they would equally say you are not your, your mind, your thoughts or whatever. But different in that they, they don't say it's an epi- epiphenomenon of the brain or byproduct. It, the, the mind to them is uh, akin or similar to an emotion or to a sensation where, you know, you would never think that you are the smell uh, of your dinner, you know, because you know, right. that's a separate, that's something, that's a function of my body. It's separate. Or you hear a bird, you don't think I am a bird, but they would say equally, you are not anger or you're not the thought you have, but yet we have decided that we've associated ourselves with the, this particular thought that that is us. But they, they would say, my reading of it is that they would say other other opinions of Buddhism are available, and um, that <laughs> uh, you, we, we've just the, the false lies and that we've we've uh, associated ourselves with this thought, with this the, this brain, this mind, this thing. But it's equally, it's just as passing, as you know, uh, uh, unreal, or as all, all the other things. You know, it's all part of the the illusion, if you want. Which is interesting that both science and Buddhism has 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 take, gone to the same conclusion in some ways. Yeah, I was gonna say this this kind of idea of almost the uh, like you were you you were talking about the forty servants in, the, in its inception on your website, and you had mentioned it's not an egregore. No, you don't consider it's not an it to have been channeled. It, no, it's not an egregore, and it, strictly because an egregore is a group is an entity made by group a group thought, yeah. yeah but that's not like that's not what people mean when they say egregore now so you also it's like that thing when people say literally that's you know right. the word it's not what that's not what that word means but now it's, <laughs> it's it's i know what you mean when you're saying it and it, it's it's a dick move for me to then pretend i don't know what you mean so right, when people right. say egregore, i go well it actually means a group thing you know i know that's not what you're talking about it's right. what what people are actually talking about is that it's some sort of self-reliant, um, autonomous, sovereign it's a being that has its own will. It has its right. own, you know, autonomy. It, it can do its own thing. It can make its own decisions. And in that, um, 47, excuse me, um, aren't. I don't. Well, let's just launch into the 40 servants because yeah. this is kind of an amazing addition to the divination slash, I would say, like psychologically um, pragmatic approach to yeah, pra- well, addressing the subconscious. You that's know? It. Well, and like at the heart of it, I was trying to be as pragmatic as possible with it, you know, because king- things can become so convoluted and so intense. And, you know, there's a lot of rules and baggage that go around an awful lot of these things, which is what the original, you know, like um, Pete Carroll and Ramsey Jukes and Phil Hine and all these, but we're trying to get rid of. And we seem in, you know, we're trying our best to put all this stuff back into chaos magic, and which is fine. They- that's fine. You know, let's let's not, you know, it's we've possibly thrown out, you know, a number of babies with some of the, this bad water. And, you know, maybe it is time, you know, for, to bring some of the stuff back in and whatever, but not confuse it with the kind of the spirit of chaos magic, if you want. And it's that whole thing of, you know, uh, UPG, which is an unverified personal gnosis which is when you have a discovery about magic or about life or whatever, and then you demand that other people accept that as their gnosis and their thing. And I think there's a, a lot of UPG and chaos magic as the minute, including from myself. Like I'm not, I'm not outside of this uh, thing. You know, I have my own opinions about it that I think, and other people are of absolutely free to disagree and should disagree. I mean, that's the whole point. That's, that's the, the whole, exactly. Magic. It's the yeah. whole point. It's the whole point. Of it. 
Yeah, because there's, you know, there's been some things, you know, personally over the years with Chaos Magic. It just hasn't had the mechanisms to answer for me, okay, personally. But uh, okay, can you give me so? Can you give me some examples? Can you uh, stop this? Now? There, there are just some use of of devotion or faith in certain things. Okay. Um, outside of of yourself and your own you know personal uh wants so and like, desires like and a, like affectations like uh, like some sort of like a bhakti devotion type thing like the hindu like the Hare krishna thing like chanting or yeah just like the 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 use and maybe like an inherent need for some of that well you see well there you go there, there there's your answer then if if people have a need for it then they should certainly use it and it's, right. but it's it's then making it a golden you know a golden calf right. or making the rule of, of whatever prayer is exceptionally works exceptionally well if you're in the prayer and right you know it's like the, the, the thing you have to remember too is that we're all being conditioned today you know socially and what we've grown up with and all of those things and rather than trying to shun a lot of that stuff what i've learned is that if you can kind of incorporate that stuff it becomes way more powerful for you because you you've like say if you know say exactly. if, if yeah. ultimately when you question yourself that you do think there is a sky god or a guy with a beard sitting on a cloud like that, that you just can't get past that thought say because you've been indoctrinated since mm -hmm. whatever no matter what you do until you can yeah, appease that angry sky god if you think he's angry there you're not going to get past that so you have right. to find a way to, to to do that you know whether that that can either be to totally go and you know become you know christian in a, in a chaos magic sense of you know put on the clothes of it do it act as if you know do that belief shifting that whole thing and yeah. you know go with it you know and if it works or go the other way and become a satanist you know and really yeah, get that out. Get get you know, hang around with Anton Levay for a while. Join the, you know, the Satanic Temple or whatever, whatever it is. You know, did the is it Raymond Buckland's um, the discovery of witchcraft? That's the one where he talks about you know, right. send the off father backwards and doing all these taboos or the you know, the destroying it or whatever. But you can't ignore these things. So right. back to if if you have part of you that uh, has a need for like devotion or, and uh, you know adoration of some sort of god figure then rather than trying to not do that do it but just choose a better god <laughs> to do it with you know you know you know pick don't don't go with the angry sky god who's jealous and who's a worse human no. than you've ever met you Who know somehow it, cares what you do with your penis oh whatever you know he's a weird <laughs> he's a weird weird dude you know he's really weird yeah. but if if ultimately you you feel you're being judged by that guy you have to sort that out because ignoring it is you know, or, or pacing right. over, because what happens, and this, I'm, this isn't, I'm not pointing at all left-hand people, or I'm not talking about all this variance, but it, there's a huge part of people who leave Christianity, become Luciferians, and what they're basically doing is switching the name of Jesus for Lucifer. Oh, totally. You know, yeah, there's the that bringer. Jason Louv quote where what? he talks about you wouldn't wear the Darth Vader mask to uh, rebel against Star Wars. Sure, yeah, you know, this is it. Yeah. Like, you know, but it's also, it's like, um, it's like literally like he did the, the, you're using the same characters, you've, you've just switched them over where, you know, oh, right. no, that Satan is actually the good guy and Lucifer is the Jesus figure, he's the light bringer, whatever, and Jehovah is the, the real Satan and Jesus is the, you know, and you kind of go, no, you're playing exactly the same game, only yeah. you prefer the aesthetics, you prefer the clothes, you prefer the wearing black, you know, right. it's this kind of thing. And it's like going, but that's a perfect example of going, in a sense, a chaos magic approach, if you know what you're at, in that, it, that might work better for you, and that's okay. Once you're aware of it, that you're not just blindly, sheepishly doing right. the same thing, you know, under a different name. If, but if you have that kind of need for a Jesus, for a God, for that thing, Satanism might be for you. Luciferianism might be for you, and you might get a lot <laughs> out of it. But you know, not to not to dismiss, but just be aware of that. You know, all right, I have these, you know, these codes in me that have you know, been indoctrinated into me, and I can't get past them. So instead, I'm going to use them. And then, you know, you, yeah. you may hang around with that with Lucifer for the rest of your life. You may not. You may, it may change, may get you past the, those bits. So that, anyway, it's yeah. your thing for your devotion thing. Once you don't demand it, uh, you know, this is the, you know, the one true way, <laughs> way of chaos magic, whatever. But if you have a devotional aspect, do it. I assume you don't. And that's why it, I don't. You. Yeah. 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 Well, and like, that's the thing, you know, I felt kind of a, a bit of a Ronin, but I guess most chaos magicians or chaos practitioners assuredly do and that's kind of the whole point 
you know, is to, uh, like you said, to visit and to to live in the shoes for a bit. And that's it. You know, yeah, see what yeah. Works. Yeah. But not to take any of it, uh, like that, that whole thing. Nothing. Not to true. take it for granted. Yeah, and to show respect. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, but also to do it wholeheartedly like like it's acting as if is means you actually believe it when you're doing it it's right. not that you're pretending it's you if you like this belief shifting thing is where you take on other thoughts or other ideas and then see the world from that perspective uh, you actually have to have to take on those beliefs and thoughts or else you're not actually doing the, the full thing it's like totally I, I will take on and pretend i like country music and i will listen to country music <laughs> But because I'm pretending, I'm not actually getting it. But if you could get to your point where you actually make yourself enjoy country music. I don't know how you do that. I don't know if that's physically possible. But if... Anything before 1975. Right. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a completely different experience than, than pretending. And from that point of view, you can make a, a, a different decision. It's like, how would, like... How would you come up with it? Like, how would it, what's a good uh, belief shifting type thing? Right. One of the things that if you can use a God form or whatever, right? And so it's, this would be like an, an invocation. So there's two things. There's an evocation and an invocation. And basically right. an evocation is that you're evoking something. So it's something outside of you. You're not taking it in. So it's like you're calling on a God. And that whole goetic thing would be evocation. It's outside of you. You know, you're calling the demon into the, the triangle of power and you're protected in your circle. Right. So it's that's an evocation. An invocation is when you take a God form or whatever. It doesn't have to be God form, um, but traditionally a God form into you. So that would be kind of like the, the voodoo or the hoodoo kind of thing, you know, where they become possessed by the, the, uh, the loa and stuff like that. So that's an invocation. But invocation is just kind of another word that, you know, like in the NLP sense of modeling. So you can look at someone that, that's like someone who's successful or, you know, who has attributes or skills that you want. And you can model that person and try to take on those attributes, whatever. So that's the same as invoking with a God. So you would right. take... And that's neuro-linguistic programming. Neuro yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it'd be like the you would take in... Say we, we were wanted the... Um, Oh, pick a god. Uh, Apollo, it's a sun god, right? Sun god. So you mm -hmm. would um, uh, invoke everyone. You would start thinking um, as, a, as, as you imagine that Apollo would think. You start seeing sunlight radiating it, uh, around you. You would listen to music that uh, you know, brings, evokes that kind of idea of sun. You could have, have a very brightly lit room. You could possibly be looking into a light. You, know, do you, do you, you bring in Apollo to the exclusion of all other things. And when you get to the yeah. point where you feel like Apollo, then you look at your problem, whatever it is, and you say, from this perspective, what would I do? And that, it's method acting. It's a, to, yeah, to, to a certain extent, but it's kind of, it's different in method acting because that's still kind of implying a kind of uh, a pretense. Yeah. In, in the moment, yeah. you are Apollo. That's, that's, that's what you're aiming right. for. And so, so the belief shifting thing is like, so from the point of view of Apollo, you can make a decision. And from the point of view of someone who loves country music, you can make the, the decision. Where you can also then go, from the point of view of someone who really uh, thinks Jesus is the greatest thing in the world, what would the, that point of view be? Is that a helpful point of view for the situation I'm in right now? Because sometimes it could be. And then act from that, that point of view. And, you know, so that's when, it, like, the belief shifting and taking the thing, you know, because you were asking me where's the, the, the line of the woo-woo. And you can kind of go, well, it depends on what I'm doing. Um, it hasn't, but Jesus could be very effective in some problem I'm trying to, uh, you know, having a, a view of, of Jesus or a, an angry sky god might be great if you uh, need, you know, to in some way feel that there should be vengeance in the world or there should be, you know, could help you cope with getting over uh, loss or seeing the world in the state it's in or people getting away with doing terrible things you could get into a state where you could understand oh, well there is this angry sky god who's going to sort them out and you can leave that kind of be behind you but then the next day you don't still have to believe that the angry sky god i guess that kind of relates to a question i had in the 40 servants you have like an, a, a companion grimoire yes which uh, uh basically helps kind of I don't know, charge and ritualize 40 servants yeah, well, well, it just kind of it, it explains what each because there's forty different archetypes, or forty different ideas, or forty different servitors, and a mm -hmm. servitor is basically it's kind of um, it depends again. It depends. You kind of you can't really start with servitors. Um, 
there's things, there's sigils, there's servitors, there's talismans. And a sigil is kind of that idea of that when you take one intent, one wish, one desire, and you turn it into a magical glyph, and then in some way you activate it. But it's kind of usually just a one-off thing. Like, I want $20, whatever. You know, that's kind of a one-off. Whereas a talisman would be some sort of item or a glyph or a drawing or something that you've imbued with whatever you wanted to have, but is more of an ongoing lucky charm, say. So you get a lot of like um, lucky charm talismans or increased good fortune or protection type of thing. So it's more of an ongoing. So you could still have a sigil that was, a, but it's more, you know, an ongoing protection thing. So it's more of a talisman. Um, right. But a servitor then kind of has some sort of more... Um, personality, if you want, there's more of a team to it. So, like, it wouldn't be just I want twenty euro or I want protection, but it it becomes like in say the first time the protector, like a kind of uh, personification of that kind of archetypical energy. So, it's slightly, it's different in all of those things, but they all are still working on the same kind of foundation of ideas or thought forms. So, a servitor is strictly speaking a thought form, and um, people mix them up with tulpas which are um, created kind of personality, uh, almost like an invisible friend, but right. done, on, done on purpose. And they're the things that can get out of hand, that can start running amok. And it's also not a tool, but that, that's a kind of another one of those words, like literally or egregore that people use wrongly. A tulpa is, mm-hmm. a, is a different thing, but in, in the sense of if you go on Reddit and look up tulpas, this is what it'll be talking about. And they, they can kind of, when people say, oh, servers run amok or they, they ruin your life or, you know, you need to destroy them. It, it's more this kind of um, person, you know, personal thought form, uh, imaginary friend thing that has got out of hand. But usually those type of things when, you know, people talk about servitors getting out of hand or, you know, ruining their lives. is Their lives are kind of chaotic anyway. You know, it's it's not, it's, right. there's, it, there, there seems to be people who have a lot of drama with servitors or people who seem to have a lot of drama in their lives anyway. So well, it's that, you know, yeah. displacement of blame too. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And God, yeah. We're, we're, we love doing that. I mean, the, oh, yeah. yeah, it's one of our favorites. So um, that so, might be a prime def- definition of woo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely. Yeah. But like the, the, the first kind of the major kind of, uh, if you want, um, thing that I find, what I would propose in chaos magic or in cult in general would be um, take responsibility for your life, for all of right. us, even the bits that aren't your fault. Yeah, and I come wanted to from, ask from you, that point of view. Yeah, sorry. Because the uh, you know with that with the magic part in each of your uh, forty servant descriptions, you have um, a baneful magic kind of section. Yeah, in some of them, that that's that's the that's the old PDF version of it. I took that out for that. It's not in the grimoire, the baneful stuff. Some of it is. Some, no, but it's just it's. Um, because people like to use magic for baneful means. Right, right. Know? I was wondering, yeah, yeah, if you had like... I uh... personally don't. I don't uh, at all. Um, and the reason why I don't, I'm not into... Not because I don't think the work... I, I certainly think curses work. The work as well as any of it do. Right. Um, it's because I would rather get rid of that situation than have yeah. hang around. So if like you can curse someone, but you've kind of now created a new relationship with them and that's that's hanging around for a bit longer. Or you can banish them, get rid of them, and then it's all gone. Right. There's this kind of there's this um, rune, you know the runes, the um, uh-huh. uh, there's what Gebo it's called or Gebo G E B O, and it's the idea of gift, uh, and it's uh, there's, it's kind of, there's an element of it in the Four Servants. He's the giver, and it's about this thing that happens that when you the whole kind of thing of Gebo or the giver is that uh, you know you're receiving something, but you see the part of thing that you you tend to forget about when you're receiving something is you've never gone into a relationship between the receiver and the sender. And it has to be reciprocal that you in some way are now beholden to this person. So that there's a relationship built every time something is given. So if you take that then from the, uh, the point of view of cursing someone and you're, you know, you're giving them the curse or whatever, you're building a new relationship with them that um, is sustaining and prolonging the situation in many ways. While, while the curse may work and things may get worse for the person or whatever the curse is, you're still involved in it and you haven't, dis- you know, um, disassociated yourself from the situation. And so has has um, a likelihood of it ex- either exacerbating the situation or at least prolonging your pain or your annoyance or your general kind of hanging around that, that problem. So painful magic, grand, 
that it kind of there's plenty of stuff that you can do about it. I'd just rather get rid of people or rid of situations. Yeah, so I, you were just basically including it to be, I guess, inclusive of all kind of magical paths. Yeah, and it's just kind of it, it was kind of from the idea of um, it, to be complete in one sense. So while I have it, I didn't take it out for. Uh, so in the grimoire, it's rather than have, having a, a, a section or whatever, it's 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 mentioned in it. If I think it's you know relevant, because like, some of the some of the four sevens would be very useful in uh, baneful magic. So you know you'd be kind of remiss, and also because I'm not goody tissues either. Like I'm not you know like if you really annoy me, I am going to fuck with you. <laughs> you know like re, you know, but it's um so I'm totally and not to kind of white light everything. And I mean I did you know I. Before Chaos Magic, before Grant Morrison, my, my kind of whole thing would have been more of a new agey type of approach. And that's all. I wanted to get into that because yeah. you actually studied like uh, Eastern medicine or oh, like yeah, energy well, work. Yeah, I did. Um, I, my college, when I went to college um, in my mid 20s, again, getting to the whole point of trying to get out of the sound engineer thing. Right. I did, it was holistic health studies. So we did like alternative medicine, Reiki, um, aromatherapy reflexology, Indian head massage, uh, kinesiology, all of these kind of kind of things, you know. So there was, there's, again, like the, it's kind of, um, they're all wonderful things. And, that, you know, but I, there's no cure and car- yeah. cancer from aromatherapy, you know what I mean? Like, and that's our Reiki. And the, the thing I have with Reiki is that, that I don't know what way it is, um, in different parts of the world, but over here, it's, it's, it seems very much a money grabbing situation, you know, where you get, and, you know, if it's as powerful as people make it out to be, then you really shouldn't be learning this over eight hours over one weekend, you know, like that kind of, <laughs> kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's, it's an eye opening kind of thing. And it's, there's certainly something to energy there. It, yeah. My opinion, I don't think it's Reiki, but I, I, I again, I've seen people do weird and wonderful things with Reiki. That's just, you know, go, mm, that's freaky. You know, like uh, mm. the ones I seen someone it almost looked like their spine was being realigned and they could walk better than that. Wow. Years. And I mean, like, I don't know that that mind over matter, placebo, all of those things. Right. But I mean, it placebo is such a strong force and all that kind of things that how do you how do you engage a placebo response without some sort of agent agency or without some sort of lie? Or would it, you know, you can't, you can't kind of fool yourself into a placebo. So, right. you know, so there has to be some sort of thing, but I don't, I don't know if it's just placebo or if there is, but there seems to be some sort of energy thing because you certainly can feel energy at different times. Like you, like a hundred percent can walk into a room and know there's been an argument, even if people are being the, the happiest and pretending, you know, you just know, and it, cause it feels, you know, there's this sort of, some sort of feeling of it, or you can, yeah. you know, there, you can, you just you just know, and it's one of those things that you can't prove. And you know, your reductionist materialists laugh and scoff at you or whatever. But it's like, it's not it's not human experience to not feel that. Whether I can prove it or not, yeah, everyone knows it. Everyone everyone has an experience oh, yeah. of it. Everyone can talk about it. But yes, oh, it's not true. So it's something. Yeah, totally. It's something. And would you would you compare that to kind of uh, what you talked about? Was kind of like the current coming through you uh, when you uh, accepted the. Uh... The uh, forty servants. No, because that that kind of it's kind of implying again getting into a proper channeling type thing. No, it would be more. It would be more the the coming true thing was the, t- the same as when I was doing the comics or uh, writing it or anything. It's getting out of the way and not bringing too much okay. my nonsense in my brain to it and just you know doing sort of like an automatic writing kind of ish. But again, it's it's not that. Um, but it's not not that it's it's kind right. of, it's like just one way of it. Don't overthink it and don't tr- don't try <laughs> to, you know don't try and second guess. You know, it, like there's plenty of things that have happened when I've written or with the forty sevens where I go, I don't really understand this right now, but I know I will. And I thought I was insane for that because it usually works out. And I went, all oh, right, that's what that is. Until I heard Alan Moore talking about when he was writing Watchmen and different other things where he, he was going, I, there'd be some particular scene or there'd be something. And he goes, well, I don't know what that is exactly. 
but I know it has to be. It's part of the story. And then eventually what had was like a, like a really intrinsic part of the ending or something. It had to be there, but he didn't realize it till he got to that point. So you can either think of that as some part of your brain or your subconscious knows something that your conscious brain doesn't know and is, you know, giving you a message. So you have to get out of your conscious way, you know, your conscious brain or, you know, he has this idea of idea space, which I find fascinating and I think is brilliant. Are you aware of that idea? You know that? Um, yeah, yeah. So basically I mean... to, to people who don't, <clears throat> it's that there's like a field, if you want, of ideas around us, so, you know, like a, the, the um, subconscious or that would be like the astral plane. The collective unconscious. Kind sure. Of yeah. The astral plane or imagination or whatever it is. And that around us, there's different ideas. Um, oh, oh, and a host of other things. But he, Alamo would say that the easy ideas are the ones that are close to us. But, you know, the bigger ideas are the ones that are further back and they're the ones to, to go for. And then there's the idea that the, um, people don't have ideas, ideas of people. So that, um, you know, that that thing of that you can have an idea and then in two years time, you would find that someone else has done something with that idea. And right. That would be the, yeah. the, the kind of thought that that idea says, hello, do you, will you manifest me? And you ignored it for two years and they went, well, fuck you. I'm going to find someone who will actually, you know, materialize me or whatever. David Lynch talks about that and catching the big fish. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that ideas are fish. And if you don't catch them, they, they move upstream. That's a that's a great book. People should definitely. And you should listen to the audio book of it because it's even creepier because halfway through someone just starts breathing for no reason for like two minutes and then it goes away it's so weird what really yeah <laughs> that's awesome so yeah, didn't mitch horowitz like do that book or he had something to do with it oh wait, well, i don't know no at the actual well, the one i um i listened to it was david lynch himself uh, oh very cool yeah. so i just wanted to uh talk about how you f- are feeling with the 40 servants catching on as as big as it has so far in the Facebook group, you have like what close to 3000 people who are intently kind yeah. of discussing and talking about their different, you know, takes and practices with it. And I just wanted to know what it, what your feeling is about it kind of becoming something outside of maybe what you intended. Yeah. It's, it, it's an interesting one because it was like, um, when I did it, I had come to the point where I was talking about this, Funny enough, at the beginning of the got into the comic rush that I had been in the thing. And it was kind of coming, it felt like it was coming to the end. There was things falling apart personally. There was, uh, it looked like the the kind of uh, thing I was doing, the self-employment art thing, wasn't going to last much longer. I was running out of money. Things were on the horizon. And I had like a couple of months left where I could kind of do something. So I says, well, I'll do something that I would be interested in and something I would use and something that, you know, just for me, just this is my last hurrah, just do something just for myself. Whereas there would always be this kind of second guess and even with comics and stuff, even no matter how personal or how much they mean to that, you're still kind of trying to market them in one sense or, or you know, make them appealing to other people. Whereas with the Ford Servants, I 100% didn't. And what I thought would happen, because Holy Numbers did really well, the comic, and then the one after that, Them, which is probably the, my favorite thing I've ever done, um, it just bombed, like absolutely, like it's horrifyingly bombed that uh, um, it just knocked an awful lot out of me and took me a while to get past it. So it was when I did, so it came to the point then that um, when I was doing the four servants, what I thought would happen would be something similar to what had subsequently happened with comics was that you put an awful lot of effort and, you know, you spend a year or whatever it is doing something and then 10 or 20 people would be interested and two weeks later, no one would care. So that was kind of the world I was presenting the 40 servants to. I thought, this will be cool. I'll get a cool tool out of it. 10 or 20 people will be into it. I might make enough money to buy a new PC game or pay, you know, the electricity bill. And then uh, after a couple of weeks, I'll go out and I'll get, you know, I'll start my real life as, uh, I don't know, as a, a bin man or something, you know, because, you know, now I have to grow up and get a real job, all this kind of stuff. Right. You know, so it was that kind of, it was a totally selfish act. Last hurrah do something that I would want. So it's totally um, a system based for me. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's like people say it's very uh, heteronormative, which it is because I'm a heterosexual, you know, it's for the, from a male point of view, like the carnal in it, which is the representation of sexual energy is female because um, a naked man wouldn't have that feel to it for me. And, um, but, but, you know, but the, that's, 
that's not to say that a naked man shouldn't have that, that, that field up for other people. It's just, you know, because it was from my perspective or whatever. Right. Yeah, this is your personal magic. Yeah, my, my thing. And it was like t- looking around at all these things that have become really more complicated. You know, the, 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 the chaos magic had become more complicated. There was all that, you know, people worried about cultural appropriation, which is a thing and you should be worried about it. But it's kind of a hindrance in many ways because, you know, we're all human. We, we're allowed to talk to each other and, you know, pick up on ideas. But then there's, you know, that whole thing of that you should never use stuff that you're not um, indigenous to or you're not part of, you know, because it's kind of that way. Well, I think right. I think there's a, there's a fairness in that where um, Gordon Might is a good kind of stance in it where he would say never do something that um, a normal person in that society wouldn't be allowed to do. Like you don't call yourself a priest of um you know, I, I, Cyrus, because the normal person right. in a society wouldn't be. You, there's training and all that involved that you have to, and you have to be, have a lineage, all those type of things. But, you know, praise uh, ISIS if you want, you know, or whatever. whatever right. Um, so all these things, going, it's all become very complicated, very thing. And I want to simplify it then. I want the easy access to these things. I think they're ideas rather than actual spiritual entities. Um. But that's, as I said, that's up playing ideas rather than down playing spiritual energies. I think they're every bit as important to act exactly the same way to all intents and purposes. They're the same thing. It's just fundamentally, I, you know, I think they're, if you want, an energy more than a, a person. So if I can take all these ideas and all these kind of archetypical things and put them in a way that's easy to use, easy to access, doesn't have all the kind of... Um, bullshit that goes with it or all the kind of uh, taboos or the rules or the baggage or any of that and just make it really simple. That's something I want to use. But again, I'm saying I thought maybe I'll put it out. A couple of people be interested. People think it's cool, but ultimately no one would really care. But I was, right. very, I was very wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Quite wrong very, with that. Um, yeah. So like within like a couple of weeks, it was like it was it became obvious that it was more than it wasn't going to be um, what I, uh, I expected it to be. But I think uh, it wouldn't have existed in such a way had I not approached it in that way. If I was trying to make a deck that everyone would love or a system that everyone would love or and all that, it right. would have been terrible. You know, yeah. No one would have been into it. But because it was so focused and I had an idea and I was, didn't care if people liked it or not, it didn't mind if people used it or not, I, you know, it, it kind of, that's what I talk about when I'm saying get out of the way of it. You're not, don't overthink, just do what it is. Let it be yeah. what it is. If you're writing a story, let the story be whatever it is, rather than trying to bring too much of your nonsense to it. You know, to br- br- bring, let it, in a sense, channel, let it come through, let it flow through, let it be what it is without trying to mold it into something else. And the Ford Servants is a perfect example of that because that's exactly what it was. It just, it seems like you tapped into that Jungian archetypal, yeah. you know, consciousness. Was 40 an expected or an intended kind of number? Because um, 40 in and of itself is a pretty heavy magical number. So I was wondering is, if all the, all the minutia was It is and it intended. isn't. Um, it, it, it is in a, in a magic sense and it isn't. Like, it's, it, I'll best explain it. There's so many things. It was 40 when I did it. Um, uh uh-huh. It was, uh, oh, I had a list of these and I probably won't remember them all in there. But it, it, it was, you know, in like voodoo or not voodoo, hoodoo, you have like the four thieves and you have like the, that kind of thing. So it was kind of, I wanted a name that was kind of cool like that. Like sort of 40 servants, I thought it was quite a uh, thing. When it came to it, um, one of the boxes that uh, you could actually physically put them in, you know, when you're making that, the, you know, the boring part of doing these things where you actually have to physically put things together to sell them and all that. One of them was that it was, you could only have 40 cards in it. So that was another sink. And it was kind of, but it was, it was like, there's, a, oh, I'll dig it up somewhere, but there was like 10 things that had 40 around it that just kind of all synced together at the, at one point that it just, whereas individually, none of them really matter that much. It's the, you know, the conglomeration or of the whole thing that you kind of go, there's something interesting in that. Right. Yeah, and these are kind of just synchronous kind of after effects. Or... Yeah, yeah, magical echoes. That's what I would call them, where yeah, things kind of echo out into it. You know, that just kind of when you, you know, when you, when you magically punch punch the air, you know, it, it kind of reverberates around and hits off things and comes back in interesting ways. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, definitely. If, if uh, Grant Morrison's this info speech changed my life, the 47th's changed it infinitely more. So. Well, it's incredible. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me all the way from Ireland. Yeah, I really it. enjoyed the conversation. It was a bit um, 
rambly and tangential. Uh, but oh, I love it. Yeah, but that's it. Like, I mean, uh, that's the way I am. If you ever listen to my podcast, it's way worse oh, yeah. than this one. <laughs> just, I just go off and, you know, sometimes don't come back. And that's just that's <laughs> the way it is. No, it's perfect. And where can, uh, other than Adventures in Woo, is it adventuresinwoowoo.com? That's it. That's just the best place to, to get. There is, there's uh, all the stuff, the Forty Seven stuff's there, including you can totally use the Forty Seven for free. All of the stuff is there. You can... Uh, all of the card meanings, all of the magic stuff. Um, you, can, you know, there's like a gift deck where you can click on it and it'll give you a quick, all the, you know, you can download a, a, like a real low res version of it just to get you going, see if you're into it or, or whatever. But like, I love that. There's way more stuff, you know, if you actually want to spend money and all that kind of thing. But everything is kind of in adventures and woo woo. And there's a YouTube channel and that I just finished the video course on the 47th, which is basically an introduction kind of, uh, of magic, chaos magic, you know, explaining all the, the different models of magic and what, what the 40 servants are, and then a video for each of the servants explaining them, and they're all up there. Again, that's all free. Uh, podcast is free. It comes out every week. Um, Very cool. And, the, and your Patreon. Oh, the uh, Patreon, yeah. That's not free. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if, if people want to help out and keep keep me doing these things or support us, there's a Patreon there, and um, in return, I do lots of stuff over there we do group rituals and all that kind of stuff but it's not like it's not like a premium thing or it's you know it's not like a membership no, you're, or whatever. Very, you're very generous with yeah. your work yeah. yeah it's just it's you know everything everything's there uh, i think you know magic should be for everyone and all those type of things but it, like i mean at the same time make it available if people want to give you money they can give you money you know like there's it's, it's balance is key in all these things <laughs> all right man well thank you so much cool Cool. Thanks, man. This here Prag Magic Podcast is brought to you by Portland, Oregon's Open Source Art Religion and Prag Magic Art Collective, We the Hallowed. For more information, please visit wethehallowed.org or support these fine, pious individuals at patreon.com slash we the hallowed. Remember, that's hallowed like saintly. H-A-L-L-O-W-E-D. Thank you, and hold on.